Today on Monkey Life. Worrying developments as the vets try to find out what's wrong with elderly chimp Kalu. For her medical issues to catch up with her now would just be devastating. The end of the odd couple. Patas Monkey Mitsa mourns the loss of long-term companion George the Lima. We're just making sure that we keep a really close eye on her, making sure we give her extra things to do, just so, again, she's not just focusing on the fact that George isn't here. And a new puzzle feeder proves a bit of a headache for Gibbon Delumi. Monkey World in Dorset, buried deep in the English countryside, is the largest sanctuary of its kind on the planet. The team, led by Dr. Alison Cronin, rescue and rehabilitate abused and unwanted primates from all over the world. You just never know how it's going to work. The park provides a home for more than 260 monkeys and apes from 24 different species. Over the years, Monkey World has dealt with a plethora of physical and mental issues involving many of their primates. Much of it has stemmed from trauma, abuse and neglect in the monkeys' and apes' earlier lives. The primate care staff use their skills and experience to tackle and attempt to solve each individual's problems. But one newly arrived primate has them all but stumped, elderly female chimp Kalu. You know, Kalu's been through so much in her life. It's just sort of, you know, we finally get her here at such a latter stage of her life so that she can put her feet up, hang out with some friends. She loves Brian. She really likes Nari. Ash is OK, and we don't like rotters. That we know. So she's been doing really well, and I'm just so pleased that we gave her the opportunity and for her medical issues to catch up with her now would just be devastating. It's just so sad, but, you know, we have to stay focused on the ball and not... It's not about me, my feelings, any of our feelings. We have to stay focused and do the right thing for Kalu. Um, and right that now, that means finding out what is happening inside of her to make her so apathetic. Kalu! It was apparent from the day she arrived at the park six months ago that Kalu wasn't fit. Health checks in South Africa, and subsequently at the park, revealed she has type 2 diabetes. Hi. Oh, this is good. She didn't respond well to oral medication, so the team changed tack and began to give her insulin injections instead. Good girl. Well done, Kalu. However, in the past few weeks, Kalu has started to lose more weight. She's eating less and less, and has become listless and lethargic. Diabetes. Alison is worried, and has called in wildlife vet John Lewis to take another look. I mean, yeah, she's just so that. finicky and fussy. She's really hit and miss today. She'll eat something, and then tomorrow she won't. The bit I can't deal with is between her ears. It's an extremely serious situation. The team must manage Kalu's diabetes. She needs both insulin and diet management, a big problem if she refuses to eat. At the moment, Kalu's struggling to process sugar. She's struggling to process potentially fats and proteins. Doesn't leave a whole lot else to keep a person going. Local vet Dave Harding has arrived to help John with his assessment. Cholesterol is a bit on the higher side. Hardly surprising, given that she lived on, you know, cream donuts or whatever. Dave's going to carry out an ultrasound to check Kalu's vital organs, in the hope of ruling out anything sinister, which may be the cause of her health problems. Kalu is hand-injected with anaesthetic and, once fully under, quickly transported to the park's hospital. Before John and Dave start their examination, the team take the opportunity to weigh Kalu in order to compare the reading they took a few months ago. 
At 37.8 kilograms, she has lost weight, but not as much as they suspected. John intubates Kalu, and once satisfied she's stable, the vet team gets started. There's a lot to do, and they need to work quickly. Being under anaesthetic for any length of time can be dangerous, and they already have concerns for the chimp's health. A number of blood samples are taken for analysis and comparison. Do you want to do the ultrasound, Dave, now? Yes, yes, yes. Because that's most important. Yeah. We've got blood, and we'll work on a drip, I think, for her now. With the light dimmed, Dave starts the ultrasound, carefully checking each organ and the area around the abdomen for anything untoward. Kalu's kidneys appear slightly enlarged. Yeah, it just looks irregular. Was that true of both kidneys? Yeah. Hmm. But her liver, normal. The liver looks fine. Dave moves on to Kalu's stomach. The team are wondering if she may have pancreatitis, but the ultrasound is inconclusive. I'm just looking at the guts and, and around the pancreas area. I can't see any obvious uh, mm -hmm. abnormality there, I think so. We see we get a lot of gas around here. Dave can't get a clear picture of the area, but he does find something. Gallbladder stones. Oh, oh gallstones. Gallstones, yeah. Gallstones. Quite, quite a number of them here. Uh, that can cause a pain from time to time. Yeah. Gallstones can be extremely painful if left untreated. It isn't something the team can deal with today, but they do need to come up with a plan of action to help Kalu. And we're now an hour and 10 minutes in. Kalu has been under anaesthetic for a long time, and John is growing concerned. They still have a number of tests to do. The team move quickly on to x-rays, which may show something the ultrasound didn't. But again, there's nothing immediately obvious. There wasn't anything definitive. Uh, there's some gallstones in there, which could be causing a little bit of abdominal pain, but they're, they're not likely to be significant in the context of what we're seeing here. The vet team have exhausted all options for today, and apart from the gallstones, can't find anything that could be responsible for Kalu's condition. They'll have to wait for the blood test results before they can decide their next step. There's nothing in there which stands out as, as the obvious cause of her apparent inability to absorb nutrients. Um, the blood samples we will compare with bloods we took in February, so we can see what changes have occurred. And armed with that information, we should be able to design a treatment going forward. Until they have more information, Kalu will be put on a course of antibiotics. But for now, she can be taken back to her house to recover. The team haven't quite run out of options yet, but the list is getting shorter. Many of the park's chimpanzees have come through serious medical conditions, recovering to lead contented and active lives as part of socially bonded groups. Because of this and their determination to always go the extra mile, the care team feel there is hope for Kalu. Bart's troop make good examples. A few years ago, female Lola had a cataract removed. It made a huge difference to her life with the group, giving her back her confidence. And life for young boss Bart has been revitalized as he learns to live with type 1 diabetes and become the alpha male. He's really settled into his role now. He's still got some bits to learn, but he's really sort of stepped up into that dominant male role, and if there's tension within the group, he will step in and dis displays between individuals. Sometimes the wrong person bears the brunt of his display, but for such a young lad, considering everything he's been through with his diabetes and losing his mum, and, you know, he he's, he's doing a good job. There's a wide age range in the group. It includes Bixer, who at 43 is one of the oldest chimps at the park. The youngest member is Toprish, who's around 10 years old. 
After a bit of a false start, she's now happy and content in the big outdoor enclosure and full of zest and life. She's the perfect playmate for one of the park's originals, Buster. He may be getting on in years, but he's young at heart. And still prone to throwing the odd tantrum. But there's still a question mark over one of Bart's family. A few months ago, following a positive pregnancy test, the team were fairly certain Kathy was expecting. I was pretty confident that, that we were looking at a pregnant individual, but obviously if the months have gone on, we've become less sure. And there are certainly physically, um, she, she looks pregnant. Um, and of course, we haven't seen anything else that would indicate that there's anything else going on. You know, her health seems good but we're getting to the point now that really we're going to have to accept that that isn't what's going on and, and maybe then at that point further investigations are going to be required. Any unresolved health issue could have an effect on the group, but for now, Bart and his family are stable and content. One of the park's elderly residents is in need of some extra love and attention. A few days ago, Patus Monkey meets her lost her best friend and companion, ring-tailed lemur George. Since then, she's been off her food, and the team are trying to keep her busy with plenty of enrichment. We're just making sure that we keep a really close eye on her, making sure we give her extra things to do, try and keep her busy. Um, just so, again, she's not just focusing on the fact that George isn't here. He was a very old boy. He was 36 years old. He'd had a, a very good innings, um, but unfortunately, his mobility was getting so poor, um, and uh, we really think he was starting to struggle, so we had to, unfortunately, make the decision to have him put to sleep. The unlikely pair came together six years ago, after Mitsa lost her patus monkey companion, Sissy Jo. George was something of a loner amongst the other lemurs at Malagasy, so the team decided to pair them up. And much to everyone's delight, they hit it off. The pair became affectionately known as the Odd Couple. Mitsa, I think, took on the role of, of George's protector and carer. She's doted on him completely and groomed him, and he's just basically lived like a little prince because she's loved him so much. So it worked amazingly well for a very long time. It was probably one of our strongest bonds in the park for the whole time they were together. There was never any issues. Um, sometimes Mitsa probably got a bit of George's food, but he was a little bit chunky anyway, so it wasn't didn't really do him any harm. But they were just a really nice pair that just loved each other, really, and just hung out and, and were really settled. George is thought to have been born in 1984 and was probably the oldest ring-tailed lemur in the country, if not the world. He never really got on with the other lemurs at Monkey World and kept to himself. In his later years, he suffered from arthritis and was on medication. Despite all this, he was a remarkable character. He didn't really do anything for anyone else. He just did what he wanted to do, if that meant when he was up in Malagasy, just sitting in the middle of the pathway with the public walking by, that was absolutely fine and no one could shift him even if he wanted to try. Um, he's been looked after by so many people, uh, both here and at his pre previous collection, and everyone that we've spoken to about him have always just loved him instantly. He's just such a great character to be around and to, and to work with. And yeah, he's had so many, so many carers, so it was a really sad day when we lost him and it was felt around the park. He may be gone, but he's unlikely to be forgotten. The memory of him will always be here, because when you go into Malagasy, the board over Malagasy has got a great big picture of George on it, so he'll never be forgotten, and we'll can, we can go up there and see him every day. But yeah, he was, he was a true character and a true gent. For the past two years, George and Mitsa shared an enclosure with the Gwenons. But following the birth of the family's second baby, they moved to a space of their own to give them some peace and protect George from the sometimes over-enthusiastic Gwenons who had started to irritate him. Now Mitsa is alone again, the team are considering moving her back in with the family of four for company. But first, they want to lavish some attention on the elderly Patus monkey and make sure she copes with the loss of George. 
At the Gibbon Complex, one of the park's newest partnerships, Muller's Gibbons, Nini and Dalumi, are about to be given a puzzle to solve. They'll want to crack it to reach their breakfast. The Gibbon team have been busy devising and building new feeders to test the pair and replicate some of the challenges they might find feeding in the wild. We'll be popping in some of their fruit feed, which they've got grapes and blueberries today. And we've used black juice, so it's very opaque, so they can't actually see the food inside them. And then we've put some uh, hose on the bottom so they can't easily access it. So they actually do have to move the tubes around to be able to drop the food out. So it'll be fun to see if they can actually manipulate these tubes around to, to gain access to their food today. Nini and Dalumi were paired up earlier in the year. They've only been living with each other full time for eight weeks. Unfortunately, Dilume lost her partner Adidas at the end of last year after a short illness. And she'd been with him for 18 years, so it was quite a bit of a shock for her. But we really wanted to give her another option of making that pair bond. With noisy neighbour Kitty trying to grab Sean's attention... Kitty! The puzzle is set. The question is... Can Nini and Dalumi solve it? The two gibbons are let into the enclosure. Female gibbons are usually more dominant, and Dalumi is no exception. She's first to tackle the new feeder. She immediately spots the fruit at the bottom of the tube. But the puzzle gets the better of her. A little more finesse is needed. Nini is a feisty character. He's lived with other gibbons in the past, but the partnerships weren't successful. He's missing his lower left arm, possibly as a result of an injury when he was stolen from the forest for the illegal wildlife trade as a youngster. But he's adjusted remarkably well. Spent most of his life with that one arm, so he's been able to adapt and evolve his swinging technique. Uh, he's incredible to see him go through the enclosures. He can still brachiate at great speeds. So even though he has lost that arm, it's still incredible what these animals can do. Nini demonstrates just how versatile he is, hanging from his remaining arm and using his feet to manipulate the tubes. He doesn't solve the puzzle first time, but gives it another go. Dalumi is also persevering. She's determined to reach the fruit, and she's nearly there. She tips the tube far enough, but isn't quick enough to grab the prized fruit before it falls to the ground. It takes her a few seconds to realise what's happened. Then she heads down to gather her breakfast. Arboreal gibbons prefer to stay in the safety of the treetops, and she hangs from the fence rather than setting foot on the ground. As the morning progresses, both Nini and Dalumi make repeated attempts to reach the fruit. It's early days in their pairing, but the team hope they may one day sing together and signal a new and hopefully lasting bond. Another group enjoying their outside enclosure this morning are the stump-tailed macaques. They're considerably less agile than Nini and Dalumi, but the group of eight love to forage and are making the most of the natural planting. They particularly enjoy their outside space during the warmer months, when there are lots of fresh leaves and branches for them to browse. These stumpies aren't the most acrobatic of primates. Some have serious mobility issues. But the enclosure is designed with this in mind and has plenty to keep them busy. Which is a good thing, as they can be a grouchy lot. They're just a bunch of sort of grumpy old men and ladies living here. They, they don't really like anyone or anything. Um, you'll give them something nice and they'll, they'll grab it, take it away from you. Or if Then they might turn around and just give you a look or a swipe. They're, they're not very subtle. There's not a lot of dignity involved in stumpies. There's a lot of pushing, shoving, grabbing, pulling, grunting. Um, but that's part of their charm. I think that's how everyone who sort of sees them and works with them loves the stumpies. The leader of this group of ugly monkeys, as they've become affectionately known, is Sam. 
He's 33 years old, which is quite an age for a captive Stumpy, particularly given his past as a laboratory animal. Sam's recovered well from the dental issues that plagued him recently. He's back on form and successfully managing the group, as he has for the last 10 years. He's in charge of five females and two males, and all have their place in the pecking order. The stumpy hierarchy is very, very strict, and it, it takes a very long time for people to move up or down the hierarchy, really. Um, Sam has been in charge of our various stumpy groups since sort of 2009, when we lost our dominant male, Scott. Um, he was sort of a bit of a reluctant leader. It just sort of fell to him as he was next, sort of next in line, really. Um, we have seen signs recently that he's sort of softening a bit towards Toto and Freddy, but he's done really, really well and to sort of be carrying on at his age and for as long as he has, he's obviously sort of doing a good job. The fact that the females like him contributes to Sam's ability to keep hold of the top spot. However, some of the girls have been spending a little more time with Toto and Freddy recently. When these two males arrived in 2016, it was assumed Toto, with his size, youth and good looks, would come in and take charge. But looks aren't everything, and it soon became obvious Toto was lacking in confidence and social skills. He didn't even attempt to take over, instead appearing nervous and confused. Luckily, he already had a friend in Freddy, who's continued to have his back. Joining them at the lower end of the hierarchy is the group's oldest Stumpy, 36-year-old Flo. They've formed a happy and contented trio. The biggest challenge for the primate care team isn't managing this group's alliances and egos, but keeping a watchful eye on their weight. It's hard work encouraging them to move and be active. We're trying to come up with ways that we can challenge them, make them climb a bit, make them work a bit more for their food. Um, but obviously we have to tailor it so the animals like Sylvie and Charlie, who are quite agile and will climb, whereas Kelly, Kelly's not really built for climbing anymore. Um, she does have a bit of arthritis as well, but Kelly's never been the most mobile and active. So it's finding ways that they can all reach their food and get their food when they need it. It's a constant battle juggling each individual's needs. But overall, the group are doing well and seem quite happy and content with life at the park. Next time on Monkey Life. Concern grows for the health of elderly chimp Kalu as Jeremy offers comfort and TLC. See what? That might be nice. It's nutritious soup. And Orangutan Oshin demonstrates if there's enough of an incentive, she's prepared to climb. As long as she can make a rapid return to ground level with a tasty hoard.